Hi, guys. So, today we are going to talk about Sir Thomas Wyatt. And he is the author of the poem we're reading today. It's only 14 lines. It's really short. Really short. It's really short. And it's called Whoso List to Hunt. So, this is a bunch of background information about Sir Thomas Wyatt. Um, he lived from 1503 to 1542. He, like, died at 39. So, that's pretty young. One of the most important things to remember about him is from this first section right here. I'm going to read a chunk of this paragraph. Sir Thomas Wyatt was a member of King Henry VIII's court, acting as an ambassador to the king. So that means he was close to King Henry and they had a relationship. They were cool. Wyatt gave him advice. He would like help him write things, stuff like that. He was over six feet tall, reportedly both handsome and physically strong. He was married, but unhappily, and was rumored to have been romantically involved with Anne Boleyn until 1524 when King Henry sent him abroad. Sometime after he separated from his wife. So Wyatt and Anne talked while Henry was still married to Catherine of Aragon and was courting Anne Boleyn. Because remember, he was with Catherine of Aragon and trying to get with Anne Boleyn, but Anne Boleyn wasn't having it. So while Henry was trying to get with her when he was still married with Catherine of Aragon, Anne was keeping her options open. She couldn't just like promise to marry the king. She was talking to other people. And one of those people she was talking to was Sir Thomas Wyatt. And Henry was jealous, sent Wyatt abroad. And then Wyatt ends up separating from his wife and coming back to England and working for King Henry. And at this time, when he's back, King Henry is now married to Anne Boleyn and Wyatt still works for him. So it's probably awkward, all of them being in the castle and stuff. And um, yeah, that's kind of where this poem sprouts from. Wyatt said his aim as a poet was to experiment with the English tongue in a time when it was thought as brutish and clumsy. A significant amount of his literary output consists of translations and imitations of sonnet by the Italian poet by the Italian poet Petrarch. He also wrote sonnets of his own, experimenting with form and structure. He was the first to write sonnets in English, influencing his successor Shakespeare. He is also one of the originators of the convention in love poetry according to which the mistress is painted as hard-hearted and cruel. So Wyatt experimented with the sonnet, and um, he is so good at it, and so many people fall in love with his poetry that Shakespeare ends up using the same kind of sonnet as him, and they call it the English sonnet, but since Shakespeare is way more popular than Wyatt, later on it's actually called the Shakespearean sonnet because Shakespeare masters it. So it's Wyatt's idea, but Shakespeare like takes it and makes it what it is today. And then this last paragraph says that he is the first poet to write about girls being cruel, evil, manipulative, cold-hearted, dismissive. And the idea of that is called unrequited love. When you guys read this next poem, Sonnet 30, it's also all about unrequited love. It's the idea of a man trying and trying and trying and pleading and pleading and pleading, kind of like the love letter we read from King Henry to Anne Boleyn. And unrequited love is that the man is begging and the woman's like, <laughs> No, thank you. Not interested. So the main elements of a sonnet, sonnets are 14 lines. They follow a rhyme scheme. There's an Italian sonnet, and that's what Petrarch made famous. There's an English sonnet, which Wyatt brought to light, and then Shakespeare perfected it. And um, some of the terms that you can use when you're talking about sonnets is an octave, like an octopus. That's eight lines together 
A sestet is six lines, a quatrain is four lines, like quattro, and a couplet, like a couple, is two lines. So if you're looking at this, this is, remember, early modern English, Beowulf was old English, the Canterbury Tales and the Wife of Bath's Tale was Middle English, and this is early modern English. So the title of the poem is Whoso List to Hunt, and the first line of the poem says, Whoso List to Hunt, I know where is a hind. And it's saying, what can you understand from this? Because this poem can be a little hard to read if you're thinking too hard about the difference in English. So if we look at this, whoso, that means whoever. List means who wants to, who hopes to, who wishes to. And a hind is a female deer. So instead of in our head reading it, whoso list to hunt, I know where is a hind. It would really be like, whoever wants to hunt, I know where a female deer is, right? So for another little second, we're going to talk about Anne Boleyn and King Henry. Remember, Anne Boleyn told King Henry, I will not be your mistress. I will not sleep with you until you get a divorce from Catherine of Aragon. So they switched the religion of England from Catholic to Protestant. And Henry's like, all right, I'm the head of the Church of the England Pope, you're the Catholic boss. We're not Catholic anymore. I make the rules. Got a divorce from Catherine of Aragon, sent her back to Spain, and then married Anne Boleyn. And this, ooh, this is um, a passage about Anne Boleyn's execution. So when she dies, Sir Thomas Wyatt actually isn't too far from her death so listen to this Anne Boleyn Queen of England was executed her husband King Henry VIII claimed she had been unfaithful with at least five different men in reality her crime was that she had failed to produce a male heir and the king had already moved his attention to one of her ladies in waiting Jane Seymour which, remember, is Edward's mom, who later dies in childbirth. Amongst those arrested on charges of adultery with the queen was Sir Thomas Wyatt, a previous suitor of Anne's. It was rumored he had been in love with her, but was oust from her affections by the king. He was later released without charge thanks to his friendship with Thomas Cromwell. He is thought to have witnessed Anne's execution from his cell. So Wyatt gets arrested, literally arrested and thrown in the Tower of London. That's the same place that Anne was held before she died was in the Tower of London. And he later writes a poem, not the one we're reading, after and Anne's death. He writes a poem and one of the lines says, The bell tower showed me such a sight that in my head sticks day and night. So they're insinuating that that little part of that poem is saying that he saw Anne die right before his eyes. And he was in jail at the same time as Anne for supposedly being one of the people that Anne Boleyn was cheating with on King Henry. And part of the reason they got to this conclusion, Henry got to this conclusion, was one, they used to talk. He sent Wyatt away. Wyatt came back and was now married to King Henry, but they all worked together in the castle and would see each other. People would catch them flirting, making eyes. And then Wyatt writes this poem and King Henry loses his bananas. So we're gonna look at the rhyme scheme real fast before we read. When you look at the rhyme scheme, you look at the last word of each line and then you assign it um, a letter. So if you look, I just highlighted hind yellow. You're gonna do your annotations in your packet. This is on Edpuzzle so I can make sure you watched all of it, but I'm not gonna put any questions on here. I'm just gonna check your annotations and check that you watch the whole video on Edpuzzle. So I'm gonna highlight the words that rhyme with hind, yellow. So hind, line one, line two says more, line two says sore. 
So more, I'm gonna do that blue, like the parentheses I have right here. You go ahead and like underline these words, circle them, highlight them, but they need to look different than hind. So hind, more, sore, behind. Behind rhymes with hind. So I'm gonna put this one yellow. Mind, hind, behind, yellow. A four rhymes with more and sore. So I would do this, that blue color. You see the patterns we're following? Therefore, a four, sore, more. Those all rhyme. So let's start with this, and then I'll see if you can do the rest of the colors at the bottom. Each section of rhyming words get the same letter, and you start with the first letter of the alphabet, A. So hind, we're gonna put that that's an A. Does more rhyme with hind? No, it's a different color, it's blue. So we're gonna call this a B. We're just following the alphabet. If something does rhyme, you'll assign it the same letter. So hind and more didn't rhyme, different letter. But does more rhyme with sore? Yes, so we'll give it the same letter, B. And then, does behind rhyme with sore? No, does it rhyme with more? No, but it does rhyme with hind. So we're gonna give it the same letter, A. Behind, mind, that rhymes, same letter, A. And then here we are at a four. A four, mind, behind, a four, sore, more. That works, so we'll put a B. Therefore, a four, sore, more, B. And then this, in the way we say it, we would say, Sithens in a neck, I seek to hold the wind. But they got a little accent, right? This is early modern English, so they're not gonna say wind. They would say, hold the wind. And it would rhyme with mind and behind. So we're gonna give this an A. So I want you to take a second and go ahead and look at these next words. Doubt, vain, plain, about, aim, and tame. And try to assign them letters. If you look at it, I already put the colors on here for you in the parentheses so you can kind of see what goes with what. Go ahead and Try to stick the letters in there. Remember, you follow the alphabet, rhyming words, and on here, the matching colors, they're gonna get the same letter, and you're just gonna follow the alphabet. So you got A, B, so next we would use C, the next set we would use D, and the final set we would use E. So go ahead and try to fill that out real quick. I'm gonna give you like 30 seconds maybe and if you need more time than that just pause me so remember follow the alphabet pattern a b c your green's gonna be a different letter this pink's gonna be a different letter and this orange is gonna be a different letter also easy peasy lemon squeezy and now while you're doing that if you need more time, pause me. I'm gonna fill in these letters silently. So, starting right here, we got that doubt. It's a new rhyme, so that is our C. After doubt, we have the word vain. That's a new rhyme. Vain doesn't rhyme with doubt, wind, therefore, any of that. So that would be a, a D, as in dog. Vain and plain rhyme, so we're gonna give that a D also. About, does about rhyme with plain, vain? No, nope. but it rhymes with doubt. And then, our ending rhyming couplet. I aim, they would say aim, not am. I aim, though I seem tame. Aim, tame, talks a little bit different than us. And that's what our rhyme scheme would look like. So if it goes A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, D, C, E, E. If I look back up here to these common sonnet types, 
let's see. A B B A, A B B A, C D E C D. Nope, that's not ours. This isn't either. A B A, A B A. So this is like a unique sonnet. It's not an English sonnet or an Italian sonnet. It's like a unique Wyatt sonnet that he makes his own rhyme scheme. And when we go to write this out for the official rhyme scheme, like if I said, hey, what's the rhyme scheme of something? You would literally just take these letters and copy the pattern. Oops, let me take that highlight off. You would go like this, then you would just write, oh, the rhyme scheme is A, B, B, A. And I would do it like in a set of four, because that was a pattern, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, D, C, E, E. And this is what your rhyme scheme would be. Cool. All right. So now, here's the whole poem right here, and here's a rhyme scheme with it. I'm going to quickly breeze through this poem. This video is already at 16 minutes. I want it to be done in less than 10 minutes, okay? So, I broke them down in lines of four, and then finally the rhyming couplet at the end. So I'm gonna read the early modern English up top, and then I will talk through the translation, which is at the bottom. You can pause me at any time, because the old part is up here at the top, same stuff that's on your paper, and the translations are down here. So I'm gonna talk through it, but you can pause me if I'm going too fast to be able to copy down the stuff on the screen, okay? So early modern English line one through four. Whoso list to hunt, I know where is a hind, but as for me, alas, I may no more. The vain travail hath wearied me so sore. I am of them that the farthest cometh behind. So we're gonna put that into our own words, line by line. That first line means whoever wants to hunt, I know where a female deer is. And I'm gonna make this small for a second. Who do you think the female deer is? Based off the context that we know, that female deer is Anne. He's saying whoever wants to hunt, I know where Anne Boleyn is at. Cause we know that he was in love with her and he invented unrequited love, right? So whoever likes, oh, oh, oh. Malfunction, I'm gonna refresh my slides real fast. Oh my gosh. I'm not even gonna clip that out of the video. Sorry if that bothers you. Let me make this big again. Okay, so whoever wants to hunt, I know where Anne Boleyn is at. But for me, uh, I just can't chase her anymore. Chasing Anne is just pointless. It is killing me, and of all the guys chasing Anne, I'm in last place. Make sure you get down all these lines, line by line by line. I literally broke it down, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. At the top and at the bottom. Pause me, rewind me. Lines five through eight in early modern English. Yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer but as I fleeth afore, ah, fainting I follow. I leave off therefore, sittings in a net, I seek to hold the wind. So down at the bottom, in our current English, he's saying, no matter what, my crazy troubled mind cannot stop thinking about Anne. Even though I know she's no good for me, I cannot stop thinking about her. And when I see her in the castle, ah, I go falling for her again, even though I know She's married to Henry and flirting with all these other guys. And I gotta stop this. I can't do it anymore. It's like trying to catch wind in a net. If you're trying to catch wind in a net, it's gonna keep slipping through the net, keep slipping through, and Anne's gonna keep slipping through his fingers. It's impossible to get with her because she's the queen. She's with Henry. Henry will literally kill them. Lines 9 through 12 in early modern English. Who lists her hunt? I put him out of doubt, as well as I may spend his time in vain. Engraven with diamonds and letters plain, there it is written, her fair neck round about. Whoever else is chasing Anne, I doubt you're gonna get her. 
You're gonna be just like me. You're gonna be sad. You're gonna be looking stupid because she's not really going to leave Henry for us. And then he says, and the diamonds say it all. Her little ring, her bling bling, her earrings, her necklaces, her crown. So right here, if I said, what do the diamonds represent in Whoso List to Hunt? What is it a symbol for? You could say for the crown, because she's the Queen of England. You could say for the rings, because she's married to King Henry, right? The diamonds say it all. She's taken, and it's plain for us to see. And then this right here, this part is the trickiest lines. 12, 13, and 14 is definitely the trickiest parts. I'm gonna read the early modern again. It says, there is written her fair neck round about. So what do people wear around a necklace? What do girls wear around the necklace? I just said, what do girls wear around the necklace? What do girls wear around their neck? A necklace. So he's saying like, you know, that she has this beautiful necklace on and it's probably diamonds like he just said in the line above. And it says, it's written around her neck. We gotta go to the next slide to get the rest of this information. Lines 13 through 14, so this is the ending. No le mi tongue, for Caesar's I am, and wild to hold, though I seem tame. So that, no le mi tongue, 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 I don't know how to speak Latin, okay? But that is Latin, and it means touch me not. And there's a story about Caesar. You see how it says, touch me not, for Caesar's I am. Caesar was the king, and he would tag his animals. He was obsessed with all of his animals that he had, and he would put little collars and tags on them, marking his territory. If you touched one of his animals, he would kill you. So who would we say Caesar represents? Caesar is a king, and it's telling a story about Caesar within this story but he's obviously talking about Henry so touch me not for Henry's I am it says Caesar's but Wyatt is being super crazy and super turnt right now and he is literally calling Henry and Anne out for their crap so I'm gonna switch this to Henry he's talking about Anne's necklace or what we could say Anne's collar is, kind of like Caesar would put the collars on the animals. Touch me not, because if you touch Anne, Henry is going to kill you. And then this last line, it says, in wild for to hold, though I seem tame. All that means, it says, I'm wild or crazy, not I'm like Wyatt. He's saying, yeah, and might look all innocent and like a good girl, but she's really wild and crazy and fresh and we're all falling for her tricks. Henry's falling for her tricks. I'm falling for her tricks. All these other guys are falling for these tricks. England's falling for her tricks. Wild to hold, though I seem tame. She is crazy, even though she looks all sweet and innocent. Right? And then that's it. That's it. And can you believe this poem literally leads to Anne being thrown in jail. Wyatt being thrown in jail, both in the Tower of London, and then Anne getting executed. Wyatt's still in the Tower of London in jail, looking out of his window and watches Anne get her head cut off because he was accused of sleeping with Anne after this poem came out everybody in the castle caught wind of it they're like ah it's literally like reality tv for all the regular people in the castle like oh my god why are you about me and did you see what we're about me and then he ends up getting her killed and then henry moves on to jane seymour and has sweet little baby edward and dies in childbirth so next week we're gonna talk about edward bloody mary and queen elizabeth and Right now, after this, you guys just have to show me your annotations, and you're going to do Sonnet 30 annotations. So you're going to try to do line by line and rhyme scheme for Sonnet 30 all by yourself. It's only 14 lines. Maybe I'll help you. Maybe I won't. I don't know. 
Pish Posh Applesauce. We'll see.